Welcome back to the Environmental Law Monitor. I'm your host, Daniel Pope. This podcast is brought to you by Bracewell LLP's Environment, Lands, and Resources Practice Group, and it's a place for thoughtful conversations. We have conversations ranging from the latest developments to perennial topics like litigation, enforcement, and compliance assurance. We're glad you're spending some time with us today. All right. Welcome back. If you are tuning in to my conversation with Stephen Cook, and this is the first time you've heard us talk about MTBE and PFOS, do go back and listen to the first episode. Unless you, like Stephen, are already an expert on the MTBE wars. That was a very helpful conversation. Stephen, I really enjoyed learning more about the history of that controversy. I've heard it alluded to here and there, you know, in my time as an attorney, but I've never actually had a sit down conversation where somebody helped me understand understand the dynamics, the players, the issues that were involved. And so what we're going to do today is having set the table, we're going to talk a little bit about the the themes that sort of we see with MTBE that we can apply forward to PFAS and how governments, industry, stakeholders, and the rest of us can understand and respond to the widespread use of PFAS. You know, we were talking about it a little bit on the last episode. This is in our pots and pans. This is in our rain jackets and our technical apparel right? Like, you know, how much PFAS might have been left on Mount Everest by, you know, people (laughs) brushing up against rocks and, and, and all that sort of thing. But PFAS is everywhere. MTB at one point was everywhere. And and I think as we talked about, that sort of presents unique challenges for how a society with its all of its institutions responds to something when we learned that there's a long tail adverse consequence to use of that product. And so so let's pick up there and sort of reset and talk about what sort of makes PFAS similar to MTBE. Sure. And being a, a lawyer, I should probably have issued in the last episode a little bit of disclaimer. Uh oh. Recognize that with regards to MTBE, there are all sorts of nuances and details that due to the nature of the broadcast, et cetera, we can't get into. That's right. There are generalizations. So those of you who are experts and live through the MTBE litigation and such, yes, there's a lot I'm glossing over and things, but there's some general principles that you can draw from it. And and one of them is to decide how are you going to deal with the litigation? How are you going to deal with the product? What is your approach? Are you going to defend it? On all fronts, everywhere, are you going to concede the field? Are you going to withdraw? When the fuels producers opted out of buying any more MTB after the legislation changed, my former employer was left with a choice. What do we do with the equipment? Not going to sell MTB to the U.S. market. And what was interesting is Europe had come to a different conclusion as had Asia with regards to worrying about MTB. They, they loved it because it was helping them with environmental issues. They also at that time had had double coal tanks for many years, so they didn't have the leakage problem. So they'd solve the storage problem. Therefore, their minds, MTB was fine. Are we seeing something like that? And not to put you on the spot as, uh, as an expert in environmental law in the international context, but are we seeing other governments? I don't know. Have you paid attention to any governments and how uh, what Europe is doing with PFAS? Is, are we seeing sort of similar, uh, are, are we seeing divergent approaches in different contexts? There is with regard to the health effects. Everybody seems to agree and be on the same page. We should limit it getting out into the water. Right. Not good. But at what levels is it harmful? I mean, EPA has sent out a health advisory level that is impossible to measure at, at those concentrations. They are well in the parts quadrillion level. Europe seems to be not jumping quite as fast to those kind of levels of being levels of concern. So- you do see different approaches. You know, everybody talks about science. The prime administration got hammered a lot of that we didn't follow the science. And mm-hmm. what you, that really means now with an EPA is more, you didn't follow the process. The process has become the science in many ways. And when you talk about health effects, it isn't just a direct measurement aspect. It isn't something you just go stick out a thermometer, you know what the temperature is. You observe, you conduct a test that isn't, anything like the real world on whether it's animals or a model or whatever, and you come up with something you can measure, and then you translate that into a potential health effect on humans. Mm -hmm. And during that translation process, there are a lot of judgment calls that get made. Some cases, because we don't know much, they just divide by 10. That's how they've come up with the best scientists. But those are really judgment slash policy calls. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you start weighing different things. You know, some compounds, there's clearly, it's zero. You just can't, lead's one of those, whereas 
pretty universal by degrees. There is no safe level of lead. Mm-hmm. But getting lead to zero is not possible in some cases. So you try to go as low as, borrowing a term from the safety world, as low as reasonably practicable. Right. So PFAS, there are, there's not a consensus as to what is a safe level. And the science doesn't dictate the answer. If you go conservative on every single assumption, you will be at, okay, it's zero. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, what do you do with that? As a company or as a regulator, you just ban it? Okay, then what? You know, how useful is that for making decisions of balancing all the other different priorities you've got? I, used, I asked the chair of the Science Advisory Board one time, I said, look, you know, we have run the human exposure experiment. If you look at the data that's available, most Americans, if not most people in any type of um, advanced society have some of these chemicals in their bloodstream. Mm-hmm. If they have it and you can measure it, it's above the health advisory levels that EPA just put out. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't, if they were really huge health effects, shouldn't we see that in the epidemiology data? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't we be able to see whatever it is that we're concerned about, see upticks and tease that out of the data? And he said, you should, but it's not easy, but it could be doable. I don't, I've not seen anybody actually do that, but that, that's something we have conducted the experiment. They, they pull out the polar ice caps and they look at the ice up there and they find these compounds up there mm-hmm. at these levels. So it's everywhere. And that's one of the differences from MTBE. How do you, if you wanted to eliminate it tomorrow from the environment, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. Whereas MTB, you had a discrete number of producers, you knew the source was coming from the fuel, you could just change that reformulation and then you're done. And there are traces out there, but once again, when you're dealing at levels in part per billion, part per million, you can leave a little bit behind and everything's okay. But if you're supposed to get to where if you measure it, it's got to go, that's a tough standard to meet and may impact what you do about it. So- that's, that's, the, that's the science struggle and the process. You know, there is not a, you know, I view true science as the ability to go and accurately measure something mm-hmm. and report it. And there's no doubt that at, you know, 100 degrees C, you know, standard atmospheric pressure, water will boil. That's a given. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of things like that when you talked about health effects. And so those, we call it science, but it's, it's, Science it's, policy. Yeah. It's it, science it, judgment. It, yeah. You can't, you can't at any point, you know, I mentioned that I taught history. One of the things that I would always talk about when we were talking about economics was that you can look at economic information, but that doesn't tell you what to do with that economic information, right? Like right. that's, that's something that we see right now. Hey, how are we going to address inflation? Well, there's things that we know that we could do that maybe would help it, but we still don't know what we ought to do. Maybe we should just stay the course, right? Like there, and that's, that's true with science as well. You can learn, you can learn a lot about a chemical and the way it affects the human body. But when you start talking about setting health thresholds or whatever, that's, that also inherently involves, you know, just judgment calls and value judgments. Right. And it's because like PFAS, there's a lot of good that it does. Right. Right. And uh, the products that it's in at these very low concentrations. And so you're talking about reformulating all sorts of different products and things if you were to just ban all uses of it. That's right. So those are the challenges. And that's what a regulatory agency is, is struggling with. And why you see EPA is being very aggressive, because obviously if it's in the water, or it's in the soil, it shouldn't be there. But the FDA is going a little slower because it's doing a good purpose in helping preserve the food, providing safe container. You know, what do they do with it? Right. And so they're not quite as anxious because it's doing something good where it is in the containers, keep preserving food, et cetera. And so those are the balances regulatory authorities have to go through. And when you're still struggling to measure, it's really tough to decide what's the right regulatory answer. And that maybe explains why, at least in the time that I've been an attorney, PFAS has always been the, the up and coming thing, right? We've been here, like I said, I think on the last episode, we've been hearing about forever chemicals forever. And, and it's been interesting to see developments in that world, but it's also been interesting to see how many stakeholders, when you have something like this that's so widespread, just how many different perspectives are involved and how many different concerns are advanced. One thing I don't think that we talked about very much on the last episode, but when we've sort of talked about the ways that MTB is similar to and dissimilar from PFAS. But what um, what was the regulatory history like and sort of where are we at now with PFAS and, and, and does that sort of sync up with what you observed at the time with MTB? Well, MTB, from a regulatory standpoint, it was fascinating to watch. Um, states that didn't use it, mm-hmm. banned it. 
So, okay, great. That was sort of you, a layup, you, you, right? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we don't want any of it to be our state. Okay, fine. Well, it's never been there. So good. But others tried to set up various standards. And so there was some state effort. But when the federal legislation changed, it just, the market opted out of it. It was gone from, from usage. So then you were into a cleanup mode. But the litigation continued on. In fact, I think there was just a recent settlement, I think, with Rhode Island on MTB contamination. So it's still, the litigation is still there. So with PFAS, it's the trail of liabilities and resolutions is going to be with us for decades. Yes. And, you know, it, it, you, it, still, you still see the ads for asbestos right. on the TV. You will see some type of thing for PFAS for many decades. And that's where I think you look at companies trying to figure out what their strategy is, trying to figure out what they do. Now, once again, with NTB, it was a discrete number of companies, fuel providers and such. PFAS, there is a discrete number that are heavy users of it, but at the part per trillion level, it's in retail code that you're seeing, you know, consumer product warning lawsuits and such mm-hmm. on, you know, REI for, as you said in the last episode, <laughs> up a mountain, <laughs> yeah. you were up to Mount Everest. Yeah. Um, we really like that being waterproof if you're up there at 20 below, you know? Right. It's really good to have that in there. And so your first challenge as a company is to figure out, do I have this material in mm-hmm. my supply chain somewhere? Or am I passing along? And for industrial facilities, is it in the water that I'm using and then discharging back out? You know, you may not be including it, but it may be in the water you're intaking. And there was a time where many of the chemical plants along the ship channel were actually cleaning the river and the, and the channel because mm-hmm. the water they were discharging was cleaner than what they brought in as it went through the process and such and went through their wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if that's still the case now with all the improvements that have been made and, and such, but that's, a, that's a, another question. Is it in my products? Is it somewhere in my supply chain? And for manufacturing operations, is it in like my water discharge? Yeah. And you need, you need to figure that out. Now, there was a time when I was a young lawyer, we talked about sampling and the phrase we often use is no sample would be taken before it's time. There was an old TV commercial about wine that no wine would be, you know, bottle would be open before it's time. And that time being, are you ready to deal with it? Mm -hmm. You're going to get an answer when you sample. This is one of those science things, real science. You go and measure. Right. Now I have a number. Now you have information. What do I do with it? Right. And so there was a thought many years ago that you didn't want to know until you had to know. Mm-hmm. I think we're long past that now. We've a couple of decades, we're past that. You have to know because if you don't know, others will know. That's the right. NGOs, the sampling has gotten cheaper, more prevalent. Somebody's going to sample for you. I mean, they go out to landfills and pull their wastewater discharge mm-hmm. and take samples and such. That is something you've got to deal with. So you need to know. Your first task is really to figure out, do I have it? Right. And that's a little bit different. It strikes me from MTBE where you, if you were sort of in a, a particular universe, maybe you produced MTBE or you, you incorporated it into gasoline or maybe you sold the gasoline, right? And, and helped, uh, you know, ran the pump on the corner. You were probably on notice. Hey, you know, I, I, I may have this stuff and I should check for leaks. I, I should, I should mm-hmm. think about what my exposure is here. It strikes me that PFOS is, is very different in that regard in the sense that I think you said this on the last episode, like somebody may be using one of the, you know, thousands of, of, of compounds in the PFOS PFOA family and not even really be aware of it. Right. Their supplier may be putting it in and it's at such low concentrations. It doesn't show up on a safety data sheet. It's, there's no disclosure requirement in the contract. So for some folks, it will take some time to really understand, is it in my supply chain? Now, you're going to have plaintiff's lawyers now who are very well funded from all their successes we talked about last time. That's right. This is their business model. They will, they will help you go find it. They will go find it for you. Right. You know, we're seeing now they're going after, was it, um, I think, Coca-Cola and Simply Juice that mm-hmm. the PFAS in the container is getting into the product and into the all natural drink. I I think that, you know, every once in a while you'll see a a report where someone has done sort of a deep dive finding PFAS and, you know, Hey, it's, it's over here too. Come, come read this article and and see what your exposure is like. And and you can look up now basically like is PFAS in my favorite beverage and you can figure out, you know, what the PPM is on average in, uh, in what you drink. That's, that's been a really big deal for a lot of different companies that make s- soft drinks and might not think that they need to be paying attention all the time to what's going on at EPA. 
right? Like there are going to be right. a lot of people that are going to be dealing with EPA and with state environmental agencies that it may be the first time that they deal with with those agencies. Yes, th- those rules will have consequences far outside the normal, typical people who view themselves as regulated right. by the environmental agency. And likewise, it impacts your, your business. You need to look at you know the contracts. You know, what specs do you have? Do you want to put a spec in your contracts of no PFAS? And how <laughs> do you enforce that? What kind of testing you require from your suppliers? What if your customers come to you and ask for, hey, we want a no PFAS product from you. What kind of indemnity are you going to give? What kind of get product guarantee are you willing to do? If you do find you have PFAS, do you have a substitute? Can you eliminate it? And will that be accepted by your marketplace? Right. Or do you want to stay in the business? You know, 3M has announced they're getting out of the production business. Uh-huh. So they're done. The liabilities won't be done for a long time, but you know, they're not going to produce any new material. So that's, those are all the kind of decisions that the legal department has got to s- help the business gather the information and get together and figure out what's their strategy, both for the business side and also from the litigation side. How are you going to handle litigation? Are you fighting everything? Mm -hmm. Are you looking to find reasonable settlements quickly? You know, just like any other liability, there's different ways to handle it, but you need to be thinking about it now and setting up your strategies, setting up your defense teams or offense teams, depending upon what side you are, Mm -hmm. and be prepared to either execute your strategy or start executing it. It may be time. Maybe you get proactive, but there's a series of questions you need to be asking yourself about that and come up with the plan because it's coming. If it hasn't already hit you, it likely will if these molecules are anywhere in your supply chain. We also talked a little bit about you know, when companies decided to switch away from using MTBE to oxygen their fuels, they had a ready alternative that was used in a, a region of the country and then everyone switched to it and then it became included in the renewable fuel standard, right? Ethanol. And and so that also made it possible for uh, for folks to get out of the game if they wanted to, right? Because there was there there wasn't that kind of pressure that we may be seeing with some uses of PFAS. Where there's, you know, we talked about the firefighting foams or the advanced firefighting foams. You there's there's not a great alternative yet. I've I've seen alternatives for cookware, right? Um, but yes. but PFAS is used in so much that there are going to be so many alternatives that have to be developed and deployed, and that will be interesting to see um, how quickly companies are able to do that. It will be. And the Department of Defense has wanted to be out of the AFFF using business for many years, Mm -hmm. but they have not found the substitute that can put out that fire in so many seconds. That's right. And they really like putting the fires out. Yes. And so, you know, they cut out the training. You know, they don't train with AFFF anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got non PFAS foams that act very similarly. So the training can still be effective. But the actual product, they finally have come out with a military specification for the non-fluorine formula. And so they're heading down that road. But this has been a many year effort to try to find that replacement. And I don't know what that looks like for other business lines, but that's something you need to think about your business. If it's critical what PFAS is doing for you, do you need to start devoting more research to that replacement? You know, what is going to work or talking to your customers about some type of reformulation that is close to providing whatever property is that you're wanting the product to have, but may not be exact, but is it good enough so that both of you can get out of having PFAS in the supply chain and such. So those, it's, a, it's not just a legal question, but the legal strategy is a key part of the business strategy. And that's what I took away from MTB is that we sat down with the business and talked through how we were managing the legal strategy. Because for a long time, the producers of MTB and the producers of the fuels were together mm-hmm. and worked with each other and joint defense agreements and things like that, trying to focus on it was the tanks. Mm-hmm. They leaked. That's the issue. Fix the tanks. This problem is solved and we can deal with the cleanup. You know, there are technologies to clean up MTB and we can get there. But those alliances didn't last forever, particularly when the liability protection didn't show up, the legislation changes. All of a sudden, the producers of gasoline are not on the same page as the producers of the independent chemical companies anymore. Right. There was a split. And so then, you know, do you want to be more aggressive in enforcing contractual indemnities or such? But this, those are all part of your business slash legal strategy that you need to talk through as a company. It seems like this is a, a pretty sophisticated question as compared to, is this material hazardous waste or not? 
and what should I do to containerize and dispose of that appropriately, right? Like that, that's, that's a, a question that you can wrap your mind around, but it does seem like uh, this requires a pretty sophisticated approach that considers, you know, oh, what's your business going to use instead of it, right? How are you going to consider and manage your liabilities in connection with previous uses of, of PFAS in your products uh, and the chemicals that you may be producing and so on and so forth? Where have you allocated risk in your contractual agreements with your suppliers or your um, purchasers of, of your products? And which contracts have those protections and which don't and where the risk is there. So it seems like this isn't just a question of tactics. It's a question of really an intelligent strategy to be deployed on several fronts to help a business sort of navigate PFAS litigation, changing regulations and so on and so forth, changing uses of materials. And it seems like you would be a pretty good person to talk to having been there when it happened with MTBE. And it strikes me that there's some interesting overlaps and some notable divergences. And even those those differences can help inform a company and what they what they do next in this issue. Another key aspect of this is insurance. Mm -hmm. What are your insurance policies? What are your product liability policies or your pollution exclusion clauses in insurance policy? When I was a young lawyer, that was one of the big debates is whether the pollution exclusion clause of the 1972 comprehensive general liability insurance policies covered Superfund or excluded it or not, and the intentional discharge versus unintentional, et cetera. But you want to look at that, you know, because there was a strategy in the 80s and 90s when there was a lot of environmental coverage coverage available to where companies gave great indemnities. I was the beneficiary in one case of a wonderful indemnity. Basically, every molecule was covered at this particular compound because the company that gave us the indemnity at that time had this great portfolio of insurance. So there Mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of risks to them. Well, in the meantime, they had bought out the insurance. So the insurance coverage is gone now Uh and the indemnity still sits there. Right. Right. And so that that worked well to to my advantage um, in that case. But But that's something, once again, that's a business strategy that plays into how you set up your litigation strategy, your litigation defense. What does your insurance portfolio look like? And the insurance carriers will start pushing back and starts, you'll start seeing PFAS exclusions or Mm -hmm. other type of riders on the insurance limiting their coverage for the difference between intentional use or added addition versus unintentional. Maybe one place where that starts dividing up, but that's a key part that's got to be part of your discussion is where's the insurance portfolio and protecting us on this. Well, Stephen, it's been great to have you. I think one of the things that I, I've taken away from this is that all the, all the strategies you've been talking about deploying all depend on a company knowing whether it has PFOS in its supply chain, PFAS and its products and so on and so forth. And in this case, what you don't know can hurt you. And so, um, and so I think that that is well taken. I, there are so many attorneys, agencies advising companies to do this, right? Like check where you are with respect to PFAS. But I, I do think that is one area where if you haven't done it yet, please go <laughs> evaluate your supply chain and, and your products to determine what's what your exposure is. And then maybe call up my colleague Stephen here to have a sophisticated and entertaining conversation about, about what you can do to respond to whatever it is you discover. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you for coming back on. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon about these and sundry other topics. Well, thanks for having me. And um, for those who want further details, I can always regale you with stories of sitting in a courtroom in Syracuse watching MTB get hammered in front of a federal judge for days. That, that was th- th- Those were fun times. So uh, it, it's a fascinating area. As I used to say in the agency, uh, PFAS was a four-letter word. CCR was a four-letter word, despite only having three letters. Uh, it, it's a difficult, complex issue. It's a lot of fun to try to dive in and get all the different diverse pieces put together and figure out how you're going to go forward. And what's different this time is the ease with which other people are going to help you figure this out. They're Mm -hmm. going to get information. They're going to find this material and they're going to come and ask for help, whether it's money or ban your product, whatever, but it's just not something you can hope it goes away. It's here and has to be dealt with. That's it for us today at the Environmental Law Monitor. Big thanks to our guests, as well as Dorn, Emily, and Austin, and the rest of our production team who helped to make this episode possible. And of course, thank you, our listeners, and we'll talk to you soon.